Four years ago, then-Senator David Ige became the first Democrat in Hawaii to defeat an incumbent governor in the primary election. Now he is the incumbent, fighting off a spirited challenge from his former Senate colleague, Congresswoman Colleen Honabusa. How do these two rivals differ on the big issues facing our state, like affordable housing, money for education, and ending homelessness? Insights on PBS Hawaii presents the frontrunners in the Democratic primary for governor in a live discussion about what matters to you. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. Our Insights guests for the past six weeks have been residents from across the entire state, from Kauai, Oahu, Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Hawaii Island. They have come from all walks of life, kupuna, college students, farmers, and business owners, newcomers, and those who have families have been here for generations. Family and community life were the most important reasons for why everyone lives where they do, while cost of living and concern about the future, especially for their children, were among their biggest challenges. Tonight, we will hear from the two leading candidates in the Democratic primary election for governor who will tell us how they plan to address these concerns if they are elected. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Tonight, your calls will be handled by these folks, friends and family members of PBS Hawaii. We appreciate these volunteers who are such a big help with this live broadcast. Now to our guests. Governor David Ige was born and raised in Pearl City, where he attended public schools. The fifth of six sons of Tokyo and Surue Ige, he is the first governor in the United States of America of Okinawan descent. Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa is the great granddaughter of Japanese immigrants who came to Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations. She was raised in Waianae, where her parents, Isao and June, ran Hanabusa gas station on Farrington Highway. Before going further, we want to tell you that there are four other Democrats running for governor this year. They are Ernest Caravallo, Wendell Kaehuea, Richard Kim, and Van Tanabe. Caravallo and Kaehuea accepted our invitation to send us their stance on the issues. They will be available at pbshawaii.org once this program is posted. We'd like to start off with was really one of the pro dominating issues of the series of conversations we've had over the last few weeks. Um, Hawaii has the lowest unemployment rate in the country, so most eligible workers have jobs, but many people still can't afford to live here. So in our quality of life shows, residents talked about that quite a bit. If you're working two or three jobs, mm -hmm. who's, who's spending the quality time with the children? It takes a toll. So, um, you know, this is about quality of life. And if we have to suffer just to live in Hawaii, I mean, it's beautiful. It's just not right. We have these phony statistics out there, like unemployment is 2%, oh, yeah. Yeah. the lowest in the country. And that and it's so, for so phony, yeah. that <laughs> right. statistic, because it's not showing that the employed, many of them have three part-time jobs, Minimum or they've got jobs that don't employed. pay a living wage. Congresswoman Hanabusa, so I'll start with you. Um, how do you plan to address this issue? How high do you think the minimum wage should be in the state of Hawaii? Well, you know, I've always thought, and, and throughout my career, the one thing that I did do was I supported the concept of a living wage. I think that the minimum wage, you hear now $15, but tied to the minimum wage is really the rising cost of things like health care. So if we don't have a, if we don't find some way to contain the other ancillary costs, the result will be that in the end, any kind of increase in wages will result with being almost in the same place. That doesn't mean we don't address that and we don't actually go forward and say we've got to raise the wages. That's why the concept of a living wage is so critical. I remember when I first started to do that, I was not Senate president, and it was very telling that the living wage in Hawaii back, oh, maybe, oh, maybe, I think it was in the early 2000s, was then at $11 and something, and our minimum wage wasn't even quite $7 yet. So the disparity is really what we need to do. Do you think, though, that there is a number you could cite now? 
Well, I think that everyone has, has said that they would support $15. I think David has uh, run a commercial on that. I don't see any problems with, uh, with saying that it should at least be $15. But we're going to need to really seriously look at all the other costs. So if we can contain the other costs, the concept of a living wage may differ. But it really is a living wage. So Governor, what's your response that. to that? Well, certainly, I agree. I mean, I think that um, the focus is on minimum wage, but I think everybody you know, believes that if, if you are working full time, you shouldn't be living in poverty. So, you know, a lot of the proposals in the past had talked about uh, raising it to $15 or something like that, and then, um, you know, adjusting it regularly on, based on what um, the cost of living or, or those kinds of adjustments so that it can be maintained rather than, you know, we legislate a, an incremental increase. Uh, and of course, every so often. the biggest drivers <coughs> of this. Uh, cost of living right now is housing. Absolutely. And, and, and I know that you folks have talked a lot about an affordable housing program. When are we going to start seeing this get some traction? When are we going to start seeing movement that people can be reassured that by the time their child is ready to leave college, there's going to be some place for them? Well, I mean, I think we've we've done it already. You know, I, I say we've completed 5,300 new homes uh, since I've become governor, of which 2,000 of them were affordable. We are focused on affordable rentals, and you know we've made uh, investments in the rental housing uh, revolving fund, so we can support uh, affordable projects uh, throughout the state. You know we have 1,400 more units under construction as we speak, uh, and we do have uh, identified uh, 10,000 as the goal for 2020, and we are well on our way. President, but what's your response to that? Well, you know the when you when you talk about building, for example. And I'm glad that David now makes a distinction between that, which is uh, 5,500 and does qualify it with, with the fact that how much of that is affordable. But, you know, there's, there's a whole gamut of needs in terms of housing. Not everyone can go out and buy a condominium of any kind. So we do need to have a, a firm commitment to affordable rentals. And that's why when the legislature uh, passed the Rental Housing Trust Fund, an uh, increase to $200 million, it was a critical as part of the how we're moving forward. And they also passed, as part of that bill, a $360 million basically tax credit to help in the meeting the 22,000 unit shortfall that we have. So having said that, what we need to do is, I think the most critical thing that has to be done is we need to ask what kind of housing do the future generation want? I mean, we all say as government, we're planning for the next generation, the next generation is our future, but, but how many of us have actually asked them, but, where do you live? But the next here. generation's here. Well, the next generation, <laughs> they, no, they no, they're, they're here, they're here, but you know what? They're the ones who are living with their, at home, but if we're going to build, and if we're going to build this in, a, in an expedited way, we have better know exactly. Let me, let me give you an example. I live in Washington, D.C. in a transit-oriented development. And I did it on purpose because I wanted to see how a transit-oriented development can really work. So one of the things that's very telling is that the part of it is apartment rentals. And it's to the young people who are in, the millennials in particular, who are working in D.C., and they're very attracted to what I call the Tokyo style of, of apartments. They don't want what we think they want. They're not out there saying, you know, I need a house in Makakilo, uh, and you know, like Daddy has, I, or I need a house in Pearl City. Well, they're, they want my house in Makakilo. <laughs> well, they, they want to live with you. I would say this, though, Darrell. I think, I think the developers know. You know. We've been working with them and talking with them constantly. Every affordable rental project, um, fills out almost immediately, as, as soon as we open uh, registration. And, and the affordable um, for sale projects uh, sell out um, very, very quickly. So, I mean, I think that the demand is there. It's really about ensuring, you know, we've totally revamped the, the state um, support programs. You know, we've changed the low income tax credit to make it more attractive. We reduced the the 10-year cycle to five years, which would have made uh, developers more interested in the low-income housing tax credit. We totally revamped the way that uh, HHFDC accepts proposals for rental so projects. Let me, let me ask then. I so, mean, we, we talked about 5,000 units built in four years. 
um, that's not nearly enough to keep up with the demand, as you, you, you would concede, no, I'm sure. But, you know, what, what, what is a number that you could point to for the next four years? Well, I mean, I, I, I know that we're going to produce another 5,000 units, of which probably um, I can look at. We actually have a list of projects. I think there are about 7,000 affordable projects that we've identified that we're tracking, that we're working with developers on to really make sure that tax credits will be available when they're ready, that there'll be funds available in the rental revolving fund to support the project uh, so we can green light them. So, you know, I'm pretty confident that we'll see at least 7,000 in the next two to four years. Are you as confident as he is with his administration doing this? No, I, I, I'm, I'm not as confident, simply because of this. I thought David said that he was gonna, we were gonna see another 5,000 built in, in the next Absolutely. five years. But then he's talking about 7,000 of that being affordable no, in well, the next I five years. Well, we've identified, we have 12,000 housing projects that we're tracking, and some of them are 12, affordable. 12,000 units. 12,000 uh, units. And clearly, and, and that doesn't count the pure public for sale. You know, the, the market rat where they're charging whatever prices they are, we're really only tracking affordable workforce housing projects, projects that are in that area from, you know, 30% uh, of area mean income to 100 for free. And, and I think that's higher. the problem, right? When we talk about housing, what there's really, what people want to know is, okay, is what, what is government going to do? How many of these housing units are going to be produced by government? How many of them are going to be part of private sector development? And what is it that private sector development is going to set aside? So I think we can't mesh all of that. If it, I think the viewers want to know, okay, how many are going to be public housing? And then what is the constraint if you buy? For example, the 10-year buyback issue that you dealt with in Kaka'ako, whether it should be 30 because they want to keep it in, in affordable forever, or whether it should be 10. You have those kinds of issues. Kapolei, for example, was a prime example of when government said, we're going to build affordable housing. A lot of people don't realize Kapolei was H then HFDC's attempt to meet the housing demand. Okay, I've got to um, stop because we've got to keep going. Okay, I've spent fine, a little bit right? too much time on it, if you guys don't mind. Um, we did talk about affordable housing. Obviously, that's a big driver of the homeless issue. But also, substance abuse and mental illness are huge factors. And we've heard uh, from many people who say that those particular things, the mental illness and the substance abuse, don't have resources that they need. Um, Governor, do you see more resources? Are we going to be able to get those people cared for? Absolutely. We've, um, we've, uh, you know, Daryl, in the in the um, rifts that occurred under Governor Lingo, the mental health area was one of the, the most severely hit in all of the state agencies, and uh, we have uh, restored all of those positions in mental health, and you know, for the first time, uh, have increased funding for uh, mental health services. So, you know, is that enough? Well, we're building capacity because we have to find the professionals and and really recruit them and and fill the positions. Uh, same thing with substance abuse. You know, many of those positions were, were part of that uh, reduction in force a number of years ago, and we are finally beginning to um, exceed, get up to that point that it was, and then add uh, positions so we can increase capacity. Are you perceiving that the same way? or No, uh, and, and let me explain to you why. I think that one of the things that we need to do, I've always been consistent in my support of basically what the legislature just passed called the Ohana Zone or the concept of safe zones because of the idea that you can bring in services. The other thing, though, that's going on here is not necessarily government restoring positions, because government restoring positions does not necessarily get the job done quickly and quick enough and, and service the right population. What we need to do is we need to really concentrate on what is it that the nonprofits can do to help. How can you do what we call POS? You know, David was WAM chair. Right. How do we do that? And one of the most fascinating things recently is to see people like the Hawaii Community Foundation step up and how they are, with their nonprofits that they support, how they are beginning to address all of these issues. And the most important part of it all is that homelessness is not one size fits all, and it isn't anything that any one person can say, I got the solution. It needs a variety, and the way you can do that quickly for our community is to tap the people who've been doing it. And I think if you look at what, like for example, what Hawaii Community Foundation has come up with, you see 
people who have stepped up and they really want to help and address this problem. But that's exactly, that. that's exactly what we did now. We brought all the providers together to talk about the fact that the only way we can make progress in homelessness is if we all work together. And it, Colleen is absolutely right. Virtually every solution needs to be tailored to the specific needs of the individual. And what we've got all the providers to do is come together and say, look, we all got to work together. And the objective is to find the best situation to help someone move them from homelessness into permanent supportive housing, whether that's on your contract and your purchase of service or it's somebody else because that they need separate needs. And, and that coming together of all the providers really focused on the challenge at hand, which is moving people from homelessness into permanent housing, and we got to work together, find the best solution. I, I gotta, I gotta go, yeah, I gotta but before on. you move okay. on, then, then the question is, you've had it for four years. Homelessness has been front and center from the beginning of this administration, even the last administration. You've had four years. Yes, and for the first time in two consecutive years, the homeless count has been reduced. 9% the last uh, two years ago and 9% again this year. But for, we're, st we're still the highest per capita it, absolutely. in the nation. It's we're a big still challenge. the highest. Yes, and it's not a solution that there's any magic bullet or quick fix. Okay. It's focused effort over and over and over again. Okay, here's an even harder problem to solve. Okay, so um, one of the big themes that came up with these hearing from these residents is their concerns about the future of their families and the f they're concerned about the business community and, and innovation and jobs. We do have a, a caller's rights, you know, how are you going to make Hawaii a better business environment? And all this sort of ties in together. That's from a Honoka caller. Many of the young people that we also talked to brought up the lack of career opportunities here at home. Um, and here's a sample of what we heard from these discussions. A lot of my friends that are my age that we grew up in Hilo, they just stayed on the mainland or moved elsewhere just because there's more opportunity, more diverse opportunities. I went to school and I got my degree in human factors and systems at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And you look at job opportunities and most of those opportunities are on the mainland. Uh, Young men down the street uh, finished Kapaha High School, went to Cal State, San Luis Obispo, California. He's an engineering student. There is no future on Kauai that will draw him back to the island. Governor, your son was a computer science major. Your kids are all in the mainland. I Absolutely. Mean, do you feel personally at all responsible for that situation? No, I mean, I, you know, Daryl, you know, when you have children, you want them to pursue uh, their careers. And I'm definitely committed to bringing them back and creating uh, job opportunities and career opportunities uh, that they would want to come back for. You know, it is about creating innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, we've supported um, accelerators uh, in our community that uh, provides venture capital and uh, entrepreneurship uh, mentorship. You know, uh, the accelerators that we have here have been uh, high, highly rated by uh, national publications uh, to being excellent examples of identifying entrepreneurs and innovative companies and then really uh, supporting them. But it really is about uh, creating that whole ecosystem. You know, we broke ground on the Kaka'ako um, Entrepreneur Sandbox uh, really looking to create a meeting space, maker space for young entrepreneurs in Kaka'ako in, in the middle of uh, all of that activity next to the medical school uh, and the cancer center to really add another dimension. What do we need, uh, Congresswoman, no, to, 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 as a metric on this? Uh, you, we, we talk about these things. It doesn't sound like to me like a lot of jobs have been created yet. It's all kind of in the, in the future. I mean, what, what do we need to do structurally to make it so there's more diversity in the economy? I think that's the key question that people are asking. Well, I think what we need to do first, and it seems almost contrary to what you said, is that we need to look at our economic base that's here that we can build off of. For example, the one thing that I will tell you, after six years in, in Washington, D.C., and being on the Armed Services Committee, when you look at a lot of the innovation that has come out, like DARPA, for example, they're all military related. The whole idea of a Google car, the driverless car, even the internet, those are where it comes out from. So what we need to do is we need to look at what is it that we have and what is it that we can tap into. When you talk about innovation and you talk about STEM and things like that, a lot of it, like in, in, in uh, Maui, in those areas, and even Molokai kids are performing really well. 
it is because of the fact that we have the tie to the supercomputer. So we need to do, as like the gentleman talked about Kauai and not enough engineers, go in there and try and develop with the, the large employers that we have that have the ability to do it. Like PMRF, the Daniel K. Noe Pacific Missile Range Facility, or here. Pearl Harbor, to me, is one of our, where we have to maintain. And when you look at the age of, of the existing workforce, there's 5,500, for example, at Pearl Harbor, who are, quote unquote, direct civilian employees. And they are aging out, the ones that are there. We should go in and find out for the, the generation, what kind of innovation do they want? And I can tell you, like for myself, I look at them and I say, let us do things like, uh, quote unquote, different kinds of computers that can come in and intrigue the next generation to okay, come in. I have to stop you. Any last word on that? Otherwise, well, I got I, a lot of your questions. No, I mean, I just, you know, it really is about investing in our people and, you know, robotics and STEM, I think, are just thriving programs. And, you know, the, Hawaii has the best programs in digital media and robotics uh, in the country, and it's really about connecting the dots between employment opportunities and students. So, so now what I'm doing, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of like trying to figure out who, what subject is getting the most questions. So I got a couple of rail questions. Sure. One, uh, who supports extending the rail to UH Manoa? And two, would you approve of increasing taxes to get that built? Governor, you, you, you ended up with this issue in the last legislature. Well, you know, certainly I do uh, support building it out to Ala Moana, which is what's currently authorized. And, and definitely we need to get to UH Manoa eventually. And whether that's um, fixed rail or whether that's um, at street um, light rail, I do believe that the system has to extend to the University of Hawaii and into Waikiki in order for it to really get the maximum benefit. So would that tax, the excise tax surcharge just have to be indefinitely extended? Isn't that well, I think that, happen? I think that that's one of the options. You know, and I think that <coughs> it's important. And, and we've seen every single transit system in this country has, um, once it gets established, has gotten a, a lot of support for expansion into new communities to make it more functional. Um, Congressman Hanabusa, you actually were on the rail board. We had one question uh, saying, what did you accomplish when you were there? It was, wasn't all that long a period of time. No. Um, but uh, what are your, what's your view on the future of it? I mean, do you think people should accept that, that the taxes are going to be necessary ad infinitum to keep this thing going? You know, like you said, I was on the rail board. And the one thing that I believe that I did accomplish was that I accomplished transparency and I understand what the costs are. First of all, the idea of Manoa, the full funding grant agreement, which is the, <coughs> excuse me, the contract between the federal government and the city and county of Honolulu requires us technically to go to Manoa. That is the preferred alternative. However, we have what is called a minimum operable segment to Ala Moana. So we're gonna have to deal with what do we do with the rest. Honestly, with what I've seen as to how the city and heart has operated, I do not believe that we should extend any kind of GET or funding on the people of this, of this city and county of Honolulu or the rest of the state until we know for sure that it is the only way to fund. I am not for that. I can tell you that right now, having been there and understanding the finances. Of okay. It. okay, I'm gonna um, move on to another topic once again. <laughs> Sorry, there's Sorry. a little water there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, during this, this videotape, you can get a little bit of relief for your voice. Uh, when do we say we have reached our maximum number of tourists? And many, many of the people we talk to feel like the tourism is, is run amok. Um, and, you know, even though tourism drives the economy, let's listen to some of the, the concepts people have. Tourism is a double-edged sword. It and is. I, I hope that in the future we can um, have un other industries that drive our economy and maybe change the way that tourism shapes our lives. I don't go to Kanapali Beach anymore. I go more up north where it is harder to get to and there are more secluded areas where I can enjoy the, the, the scenic beauty and the, the ocean. <laughs> There's a conflict between people who, who feel that, the, that we're getting overcrowded enough that, we're, that people are not, they're coming to Kauai for a Kauai experience that they can no longer have because Kauai has changed. 
Governor, how do you feel about this, this issue? I mean, do you agree that there's too many tourists here? Uh, and how do you balance the harm that it might be done to the value of the industry? Well, I mean, I do think that we have to start beginning to manage tourism rather than continue to, to promote it and, and see it grow indefinitely. I do think that vacation rentals um, is a problem because it clearly is driving um, visitors and daily visitors into residential areas. You know, and we want to keep, we want to keep the visitor industry in in the locations that are zoned and, and appropriately regulate them. I think that that's very important. And if we do that, then we can make investments from the TAT into infrastructure that helps us deal with and and creates a better uh, win-win for the residents as well as the visitors, and then invest in, in the beauty and, um, and the parks of Hawaii, which both our visitors and benefit, uh, um, residents would benefit from, you know, um, beach replenishment, um, expansion of parks, um, improvements in facilities for hiking and, and other kinds of areas, I think uh, benefit the visitor as well as um, the resident, and we should be doing those. You're, you, you, do you have a, a, a formula? What do you think is the key to, uh, he brings up the vacation rental thing, but I'm, I'm curious as whether you think there's already resources in, in government to do what he just described. You know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, some, a colleague of both of ours was uh, Fred Hemings. <laughs> Fred Hemings always had this thing, every year he would put in a bill about carrying capacity. And what is the carrying capacity, for example, of Oahu? And that went to the whole issue of what is it that we can withstand? And in terms of the tourist burden and everything else. I think that the, as the young woman said on the video, tourism is a double-edged sword. Because when you look at the amount of money that the state relies on in terms of the transit accommodation, the TAT, the TOT, and everything else that they've attached onto that, it is clear that the general fund relies on this money. I have issues as to whether the, those funds should go directly into the general fund or should be a special fund, and because it, it is a special fund, and it should be used really to address all the costs associated with, with tourism. We are spending a lot of money to market Hawaii. <clears throat> well, I don't think we're spending a lot of money to market Hawaii. It's so. about 60-something percent of the money goes into the, the quote-unquote, the general fund. David would know that better because of the fact that he was Ways and Means Chair, but I remember when I was Senate President that, you know, we would always look at the amount of money that was generated. <clears throat> that money has even grown more so than what we've had in the past. Let me ask, though, I mean, the, the, this question <clears throat> ended up bringing up the vacation rental industry. Um, you, you folks have struggled with the legislature to get a bill through. What would you propose, and what do you think is the linchpin that's going to get something done? Because we've been talking about this for years, and nothing has really happened. I think the most important part of it, and, and I was in San Francisco, you know, the former mayor is a good friend. And so I went back to, to ask this question, because I heard the rumor that the city and county of Honolulu, the council, was looking at the San Francisco model. So let's be very clear. You cannot do this without the counties. And you have to be, if you're the state, you have to be consistent in terms of that application. So the real issue is what do the counties believe? And, and David said it. He said, where shall we grow? You know, where shall we allow this to happen? In San Francisco, they've made a distinction between people. And, you know, we, we see this. I don't think people want to cut. Let me interrupt you, though, because the, the thing <clears throat> about Hawaii is that we've got this incredibly centralized state government. The counties can't do hardly anything without the state, you they, know, they, letting no. them do no, it. No, they have home rule on, on but zoning. But zoning, yeah, is, zoning is, is and theirs. regulation is definitely It's theirs. theirs. And then, and but the other thing is... generally is not, except for property tax. Property tax, but notwithstanding that, until they determine what is legitimate, arguably the state can't come in and say, okay, we're going to tax that. Because the question is, is the state going to legitimize an illegal activity by doing the tax? And, and I believe that there is also a strong sense that kupunas who rent out a single room within their home to make ends meet, that, that, you know, that's something that people want to look the other way and let happen. So these are things that the counties, respective counties, have to decide because they always say, we know our islands the best. Sounds like you guys kind of agree on this. So I, I'm gonna, I I'm think gonna move so, along. Yeah. Uh, we have accumulated almost unpayable public employee pension and medical bills. 
uh, would either candidate favor promulgating a law that puts new state hires into a participatory pension plan like 401k. So the question of, about reforming the system, obviously the bills keep growing and the governor's yes. been trying to pay, pay it forward as they say. Um, well, you've been I... accused of raiding it back when you were in the Senate presidency. So where do we go from here? Are we going to be able to take care of this? Do we need to reform the system so the benefits aren't so generous for new people? Let, let's go from the viewer question. Well, I, I, I believe that what you need to do, and this is all a function of primarily collective bargaining because almost every public employee believes uh, is a member of a unit. So the ERS plays a critical role. And, uh, you know, in 2012, for example, I think we saw the most major changes in how the pensions are, are calculated when Wes Machida was the head uh, or the executive director of the, the ERS system. So th what this viewer is, is re referencing is something that I believe needs to be part of the discussion if we're going to get down. So Wes Machida has told me that we're about 15 years now in terms of unfunded liability. Mr. Machida right. is head of the pension system? No, he, he was then. He was David's but budget, he was my budget, budget director. director. And then he resigned, and then he's now on the board of ERS. He okay. took um, Colbert Martin I appoint, I appointed it. But, but Darrell, let me just say, and maybe the viewer <coughs> is not aware, we have totally revamped the pension system today without going to a defined contribution system. It's still a defined benefit. But we've reduced the benefits, so all employees hired after uh, July 30th or July 1st in 2012 gets a smaller pension. We've increased the employee contribution, so they will be, during their career, paying more into yeah, a right. system, right? We have uh, stopped spiking. Um, we basically said overtime will not be included in the pension calculation anymore. We've increased the retirement age, so the, all of those workers starting uh, in 2012 will now have to work longer before they can retire. And we've made the employer responsible for pension spiking. So we have significantly changed, and as the current um, retirees age out or die, then we will get into a better balance. So I do believe that the pension system is sustainable as is, and we can look at other changes. And that's the 15-year uh, estimate that West Machida, because West Machida was head of ERS in 2012 when all of this was done. So that's what brings us to the 15-year the deficit in terms of unfunded liability. Okay, so moving on now to another issue that was brought up in our programs that from all people from around the island, this concern about education. And one of the things you, you hear, especially from folks in the neighbor islands or rural areas, they ask this question, is the ed education money spread equitably around the state? It's supposed to be, that's the policy, but there are people who don't think so. So let's listen to what they have to say. Our schools are suffering because all the money comes to the bigger schools on Oahu. Our school is barely able to support itself. It's not able to support itself. We're not getting our fair share of money. And it's not just us, it's Hana, it's Molokai. So it's all Oahu, everything is Oahu. That's a difficult perception when you're trying to run a statewide race. Is, is that true? Do you feel like there is fair spending across the system or, or what? You know, I grew up in Waianae. And I, and I will tell you that the, the, the concern that people just in rural Oahu has is they believe things are Honolulu-centric and not even Oahu-centric, or as the, the, the person commentating on it said that they all thought that everything was in, on, on Oahu. I don't, I don't think that it's really just a per capita spending. Because on a per capita spending, the DOE will tell you that they are spending the same amount per child. Charter schools, however, will tell you that's not true because they don't have the, the CIP portion of it uh, included. So I think when you look at it, it isn't just the per capita spending. It's the needs that the respective schools have that are not covered in simply how much money we give them. So you're saying that the, the DOE should put more money into rural schools, neighbor island schools, where it actually costs more to help those kids get a better education? Of course, because they're all important to us. All the kids are important to us. 
Absolutely, and one of the things that we're promoting now is just the notion that uh, of school empowerment and engaging the community to be part of it. You know, we're ending the one size fits all philosophy of the previous administration, where they wanted all the schools to look the same and do the same and teach the same things on the same day, into uh, empowerment. And uh, and let's be clear that those sc rural schools, you know, in Hanai, in Molokai, in Lanai, do get additional resources. But you know, there are really looking at the system and asking the question, what more do we need to do? We know that, um, I've talked with uh, people on Molokai and Lanai, it's hard to get teachers there because people don't want to be on Molokai and Lanai. So what is it that we have to do? You know, we used to have a robust teacher cottage programs on Molokai and Lanai, and we still have a few cottages, but you know, do we have to provide housing for the teachers to entice them to be there? How do we get principals to commit to being the principal of Lanai High School so that they can develop the programs? You know, leadership starts at the top in a school, and it starts with the principal. How do we make sure that we can, we can have professionals, principals, <laughs> and teachers really commit to work with the community and commit long term so we can see the education improvement that the students deserve. We did get questions about teacher shortages and so on, and particularly that is a major rural and you know mm -hmm. neighbor island problem. Well, how do you see solving that problem? You know, though I um, did not like uh, when I chaired the Felix Investigative Committee, the one thing that uh, was very clear on that to bring to bring the teachers into areas that needed the, the support is you, you have to pay a premium. You have to be willing to pay. If you're not willing to pay, they're not going to go. Let me ask you as a yes or no question because <laughs> it, it's going to be a yes or no question on the, on the ballot. I feel for yes, you. Yes, sorry. Uh, is, is, is this constitutional amendment being proposed that came out of HSDA, was approved by the legislature, you, guys, you didn't have any opportunity to veto it or whatever. Will you support that constitutional amendment, either of you? I, I do uh, support putting it in front of the public. I think that they d it deserves that question, and I do support the amendment. I do believe that we should look at uh, other opportunities for revenues, especially in, in income-producing properties. That's what the amendment uh, Yeah, I supported yeah. The, the, uh, the amendment, but I'm, I'm supporting it because I feel that it gives the people the opportunity first. Because, you know, we all say we support education, but every time there's been an effort to do additional tax or, or whatever, then people start to act very strangely about those kinds of endeavors. The other thing that I've, and I've told this even to the teachers, is that, you know, this constitutional amendment is going to be very confusing to the general public because it doesn't have the enabling legislation. Right. So you don't know for what this money is going to attack, where it's going to tax, and what the money is going to be used for. So if there's going to be any problems with it, it's going to be the fact that people don't know what is it that they're voting for with this constitutional okay. amendment. Good, interesting. So um, a, a number of questions about food sustainability and agriculture, and I know this is something that you have um, pushed, although there were criticisms that you're pushing a program and setting goals when there's no measurement available to see whether it's accurate or not. Uh, what are the two candidates' views on food sovereignty and sustainability? Why are we not talking about sustainability and sustainability in agriculture? Uh, bring students back for these jobs. Uh, Congresswoman Harabusa, do you feel that uh, more can be done? It is, is really, is food sustainability a realistic goal or is that just a pipe dream? Well, you know, sustainability is something that we actually started in the legislature back in 2008 when sustainability isn't a word that's used as an adjective to describe everything. And in, and in 2008 when we did Sustainability 2050, it's a whole variety of different things as to what is meant by sustainability. I felt sustainability was the ability to have our children and our grandchildren here, for example. Food and energy and all these different components all play into that. I think that we have to get to the point where we have food sustainability, but we also have to be realistic as to how is it that we're going to grow. So what I've looked at the agricultural thing is I go to see somebody, a friend of mine, who actually imports the, a lot of the food products and say, how do we go from farm to table? Tell me, how do we do that? And the response is, people have to grow differently than the way they're growing now. They have to understand food security is a major component of it. But we can't just go farm to table like the way many of us envision food sustainability to be. 
So we've got to change that paradigm as to exactly how is it that we attack this specific issue. It's going to take a while because I think you also have to say, who is it that's going to grow? This person has a good idea. Bring them home to do that. Not uh, very many people want to follow. Governor, have you really made, have we made much progress on this issue? I think we, we have made significant progress, Darrell, and I, I'm not exactly sure. They used to uh, collect data, and, and the federal government stopped collecting it. So, you know, you, you can see, I, I use the anecdotal Costco food test, and I know when I go through Costco, there is so much more local produce, you know, lettuce of all kinds, uh, tomatoes, eggplants, uh, uh, zucchini, uh, a whole bunch of things. So, but but getting back to food s sustainability, is it a pipe dream? Absolutely not. It's food sustainability uh, is something that we can do. You know, the peoples of the First Nation of Hawaiian, Hawaii was sustainable. They supported a population of more than a million people, growing and and doing everything for their own selves. I do believe we can, but it does uh, require a change in mindset. We need to get the university back engaged in the College of Tropical Agriculture, being leaders in technology and, and growing food for consumption. You know, they used to do that, um, focused on sugar and egg, and we got to get them back. I want to bring, uh, bring up another piece of uh, videotape from our series of interviews. This is on this very issue. Um, the this idea of local food production, yet we talk to farmers who say that it's they're barely surviving out there, even at this stage, even with demand for their local work. So listen to that sound too. The costs of um, farming is going up, and then the regulations are going up. So the challenges of um, being in agriculture, you, you really got to put a lot into it now. Our Department of Agriculture, um, uh, as a percent, it, it, it gets less than a 1% of the state budget. Um, and if we're going to do anything significant in agriculture, uh, we have to look at that. So, I mean, specifically, though, what can you do for farmers to, to get that? So, I think it's a couple things, right? I mean, food production is very different than sugar and pineapple. So, what is it that we need? Um, it is food uh, safety and security, so helping with the regulations, a food processing facility. Obviously, farmers are going to be smaller farmers, not the huge plantation. So it's about how do you support diversified ag with smaller farmers producing crops and helping them get through the food regulation. So it means that uh, making investments on joint facilities that uh, helps them with processing. It really is about asking the university and funding them and ha asking them to step up to really help the farmers be more economical, more profitable. One more, one chance to answer. What do you think? The gentleman who spoke, Eric Tanoe, I had a meeting with him on the Big Island, and Eric is the one leading the, the way. But you know, we have to also realize how our farmers are all suffering. He brought up, when I went to talk to him, it was the, it was the papaya farmers on Puna and Kapoho. 80% of our papaya is is grown there, 50% in Kapoho, they're not there anymore. The way that they farm is also different than people like in the shipment estates that rent land. The other ones, like avocados, everything, or even on Kauai, with this latest flood, who did it hit? It hit the Hanalei farmers. We need to, to get to the point where we can look at our farmers and protect them and understand what is it that they're willing to grow and what is it going to take. Waimea, for example. They do a lot of lettuce crops, but we need to find also a way. How do you ship it to Oahu? Right. Oahu's the demand. Okay, I gotta move along now because we are zipping along. Um, a number of questions about health care. Uh, what are you doing about rural health care on the neighbor islands? Another question, what do you plan to do to curb the physician shortage? In Hawaii, would you consider tort reform and or tax breaks to get more people willing to be doctors? Um, and plans for the long-term care for the elderly of Hawaii, which is the silver tsunami we keep talking about. Uh, Governor, what's in the works? You've been at it for four years. What are you, do, what are you doing about well, that? Well, I do think, and you know, we just uh, launched the second residency program. I do believe, and we see the s statistics, that the overwhelming number of doctors end up setting up their practices in the communities that they do the residency in. You know, I, I was proud to support the residency program at Hilo Medical Center. We're getting into that second class, and you know, the hope is that having doctors uh, do their residency in the neighbor islands, uh, they'll be encouraged to set up their practices. We need to have more residency programs in rural communities on the neighbor islands. I think that that's one direct 
tangible way that we can get more doctors out into the community. I actually just met with the, uh, uh, a group of doctors in, in Hilo, uh, and they are concerned about who is going to take over for them. So they are, they are in the process, and there's one gentleman who recently did it. He wasn't a doctor. They're, they're, they're coming up with scholarship programs to ensure that they can take the youth of the students from the community and fund their education, of course, with the promise that they return. Really very similar to the way Native Hawaiian grants are, are also working. But they feel, they feel that what's going to happen to rural health? Where are the doctors going to come from? And their sense is if they bring the, the kids and the students from the community and see their education through, they are the more likely ones to come back because they have a sense of belonging. You know, just to, I would throw out this question because we actually, um, when Hawaii News Now did our debate, we, we had the congressional candidates. You've been in Congress, obviously, and there was a question about single payer system. Everybody's so vested in the prepaid health care system here, but I mean, would you guys, do you think that a single payer system on a nationwide basis would help Hawaii's problems with its medical care system? I don't, I don't, single payer, the difference between single payer and prepaid is who pays. It's, it's, and it's who pays and not how you pay. Single payer is how you pay. Prepaid is who pays. So I think that if we ever give up prepaid, you will see a total change in, in how people here are able to secure their health care. Right. Then you, you can't do that. <laughs> well, why not? Because if you do, if you do single payer system, right, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up, and if you do away with prepaid, so that's the question. I've always told people if you, if you keep prepaid and figure a way to integrate the two, when we haven't been very good at integrating, quote, Obamacare no. with prepaid, if you figure out a way to integrate the two, that may be an absolute win-win situation. Governor, However, I, I, mean, I, I just, yes. I cannot believe that the Congress can solve the health care issue. I don't have any confidence in, you know, Hawaii was ahead of the game, 45 years ahead of the rest of the country in, in having health care for everyone. And I, I prefer to manage it ourselves and, and improve prepaid rather than count on the federal government. I know you guys Th that, wait, that's okay. a great statement because if that's the case, then the question is why hasn't this administration and uh, uh, when, when this all happened, why haven't they used the, ex the, the both David and, and Niels, and okay. is why didn't they use the the exemptions within Obamacare that made Hawaii different? We have an exemption; it's Section 1560. We also have an innovative plan program, which is 1332, which I expected them to utilize. <laughs> that's too technical. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean that's if you want to go check it out, you can but, check it out. And but it's, let me it just say this: done. you know, uh, Governor Abercrombie committed into. Uh, Obamacare before I became governor, I, I would have done something different. And we have exercised the flexibility that we have to make sure that we that offer to our citizens a better health care plan than we would get. Okay, no, I, it was I, only I, on small business, but go ahead. Okay, all right. So um, this is going to be really a lightning round, but there's a lot of very specific questions that I'd like to get to from our viewers who have been very diligent about calling us and our great volunteers up there taking these down. So legalization of camp cannabis. Do you support it? If so, what are your plans to make Hawaii join other states that already have done so, including the entire West Coast and Nevada? Um, Governor, you support uh, I, I'm opposed to legalization until federal government changes it. I think it's confusing to people for it to be Schedule One substance at the federal level, but um, legal. People have a, a misnomer that it's actually legal when it's not. I agree, but I also think it's going to happen. So the other thing we need to do is have laws in place to make it safe and things like, uh, are we going to follow the alcohol level? type of determination of when one is intoxicated. But you, but you both kind of get it, you both have a sense that it's going to come. We just have to be ready for it. Yeah, that's right, kinda, certainly. Um, legalized gambling. A lot of people think that that's a solution to a lot of problems. Governor, I know you No, I'm opposed it. to legalized gambling. I've always been opposed. How about a little bit? <laughs> no, no, there's no little there's bit. There's no little bit, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Governor, we did get a question that's more specific to your performance. Uh, how is a sexual predator able to walk out of the state hospital 
If you are reelected, how can the public trust that your administration will be competent enough to reassure us that a similar incident will not happen again? This this could be put. You could also put false missile alert at the top of this question. You know, and I, I you know, I just is this said, about competence. Though? No, well, we did look at that. We've um, been transparent about the investigation. We took immediate action to assure that it doesn't uh, happen again. You know, I um, made building a new facility a priority. One of the challenges with the state hospital is that it really is doing something it never was designed to do. I guess what the question becomes, though, that your, your appointees were the people in charge of these agencies, and yes. there were failures. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, and, and like I said, so we have, um, you know, for emergency management, for example, we do now have a, a, a new administrator who's providing terrific leadership. If you look at the response to the flooding in Hyena and Waineha, uh, East Honolulu, and look at the eruption event in East, East um, in Puna, and I, I do think we've gotten compliments about um, the, the state response, the federal state county partnerships, about being proactive, about taking action to shut down the uh, Puna geothermal plant and make it safe for everyone, uh, and all the other activities, getting uh, federal de declarations. Um, okay. You know, we have done quite a lot, uh, and it's the same people with new leadership. Okay, your own comments on the, that issue, the competence of this administration. Well, I think you, you cannot just simply say, well, we've, we've taken care of it, because I don't think they, they have. First of all, when it comes to the false missile alert, it's really, and even the examples that the governor cited, they're, they're federally related. You have to have a good relationship. And we have actually supported the efforts of the state to get certain things done. The most important thing that I think we are doing is we're getting it to the point where we're saying DOD is the one who has to take over the missile alert system. You can't leave it with Hyama. I don't care who the governor has in charge of Hyama, that Hyama entity cannot be the one who takes care of the false missile alert. Because you look at what happened for 38 minutes and what happened to the people. You know, Governor, I just was remind, your answer reminded me of something, and that is that when it comes to the state hospital, there was a, there was a big announcement of an investigation. but. It's still, I don't know whether it's been six months or seven months, yeah. it's been a while. I keep Where asking is it? every single week and the Attorney General's office is handling it and they keep saying they're very close to closing it out and announcing the is, results. Is August 11th the deadline or? No. I, That's the primary election, just kidding. Okay, so uh, TMT, uh, I think you both are supporters of the TMT. However, the question comes up is if, it, if push comes to shove, what are you willing to do to get it built? Um, I'll start with you, Congressman Hunnipus. If, if, if the, it's approved by the Supreme Court, what's it going to take to get it built? What's the strategy for getting it up on the mountain against all that um, protest? I think, I think we have to first step back and understand what the problem is. The first thing is the University of Hawaii, and the question would be, is abdicating it to another entity uh, like the, the, the Mayor Kim at all, is that going to do it? I think not. I think what we need to do to get it built is you got to bring in the whole Native Hawaiian community and the Native Hawaiian community that is vested in the area. The land of Mauna Kea, up to the, about the 50% of Mauna Kea, is really Department of Hawaiian Homelands, but it's Hawaiian homelands. And the question is, which one of those homestead communities have the, quote, the lineal rights to that? The only way we're going to get around this, because the protectors, they have a valid issue themselves, is to go to the communities and get it done. Well, let me, let me get, let me, I, did, I think I need to ask you to be a little more specific here, because I think that the governor might say, well, we've been doing that, and we think we've made progress on that, and we consulted quite a bit. But at some point, if, particularly if the Supreme Court approves it, that means the process has been completed to the satisfaction of, a, of, of the Supreme Court. Well, that's if not that true. Happens, there's two decisions you have a, to have. There's a sublease. There's a sublease. And the question is whether the University of Hawaii but is going to do Do you want to answer that, that question or not? What well, would you be no. willing to do? I'm, I'm, if you're asking me if I'm willing to put the uh, National Guard there, no, I'm not. Because I think that's going to be the worst thing and the worst statement on Hawaii. I'm okay. not willing to be. And I also have issues with whether it's constitutional. Okay, good. Thank you. And then, Governor? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, as the permit had progressed the last time, we do, did put together a task force headed by the Attorney General as the state's chief law enforcement officer. And he did work with county police and all of the law enforcement throughout state government to put, develop a plan to assure 
that uh, everyone's rights uh, would be protected, and that includes pro protesters and ability to protest, as well as the permittees and being able to construct. And okay, we're committed I have to, to doing that. I have to. I have one minute, so I'm going to ask a question that you could each have 30 seconds to answer, and that is, what makes you different from the other person? I'll start with you, Governor Ike. You know, I'm a collabor collaborator. You know, leadership is really about engaging the public, finding innovative solutions, and implementing it. And I have a record of accomplishments of the things that I've been able to do as, as governor, working with all of the people of Hawaii. I believe leadership is earned, not something self-proclaimed. And one of the most critical parts is the fact that you need to have all the three branches of government work together. And right now, I can tell you, with all the calls I've gotten, the governor has upset the legislature to no end because he has not acknowledged that the $100 million to, quote, cool, which he originally said air conditioned 1,000 classrooms, was their initiative to get the money to him because the governor was going to okay. use gems. Okay, so I'll give you five seconds to respond to that. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying the proof is in the pudding and I've gotten our administrative package, the priorities of our co um, community is reflected in the budget that I've been able to get past. Well, thank you so much, both of you. And thank you for our audience tonight for joining us. And we thank, of course, Governor David Ige and Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa for a very vigorous effort. A reminder, when this show is posted at pbshawaii.org, you can see where two of the other four Democrats in this gubernatorial election stand on the issues. In three weeks, all three candidates Candidates in the Republican primary for governor, John Carroll, Andrea Tupola, and Ray LaRue, will appear on Insights. That's July 26 at 9 p.m. That's a slightly different time. Next week on Insights, the race for the state Senate seat in District 23, which covers Kahalu to Mokulea on Oahu. Former state Senator Clayton He is challenging incumbent Senator Gil Riviere. Then the four candidates vying for Honolulu City Council. District 6, Makiki to Mwanalua, Tyler Dos. Tyler, Dos Santos, Tam, Shouldn't Rush, Ikai Kahasi, and Zach Stoddard are challenging incumbent Carol Fukunaga. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.